What's up, .NET developers? Are you currently building and running applications and containers today? Or you're curious about containers in general? Well, in this video, we're going to go over some of the options for building and deploying and running containers in AWS right here on AWS for the .NET developer. Hey, folks. Isaac Levin here with another episode of AWS for the Donna Developer. If you're a Donna Developer and want to learn more about AWS, be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know what other kind of content you'd like to see. If you've been following along, we have looked at deploying and running apps on Amazon EC2 as well as Elastic Beanstalk. And if you haven't seen those videos, be sure to check them out. Those options are great if you have a requirement to have a fully fledged instance that you want to configure and manage. But what if you want to run your Donna apps in containers and take advantage of all the great benefits of using containers? So let's go over some of the AWS services we should be aware of when we are building containers and how we can use each of them to get our apps to the cloud rapidly and efficiently. To start, when we are talking about containers and hosting them, regardless if it is locally or in AWS, we need to be aware of the definition of our application. And for folks new to containers, that definition is called an image. For storing images of our containers, we should use a registry as that allows us the flexibility to not have to ship in the definition of our containers whenever we need them. Using a popular container registry also gives us additional benefits like caching and authentication, so the process to deploy our apps is even simpler. If you are building apps that run in containers in AWS, look no further to store those images in Amazon Elastic Container Registry, or ECR for short. ECR comes with cross-region and cross-account replication, which makes it easier for us to have your images where you need them. ECR also comes with pull-through caching rules that provide a mechanism to cache repositories that may live in remote public registries, like Docker Hub, for instance. Doing this ensures you have the latest version of that image as close to your ECR instance as possible, which greatly reduces latency when we are pulling down those images to build our containers. The largest benefit to using ECR is its deep integration with other ECS services, such as Elastic Container Service and Elastic Kubernetes Service, which we will talk about later. Having this integration allows you to have all your container-related workloads all in one centralized management experience within the AWS console. I mentioned the ability to set up private registries that you can sync public repositories to, and with that brings a heightened level of security to ensure our images are never pulled down to locations we don't want. And taking that one step further, ECR also has built-in container image scanning, which can be helpful to identify and prevent potential vulnerabilities so you're aware of a dependency that might be compromised. This is exceptionally important to ensure your applications are as safe and secure as possible. Now let's talk a little bit about how we take those container images and define our application and turn them into apps running in the cloud. When we deploy containers to AWS, we have a few options to host those containers, depending on our needs and level of complexity of our apps. The first option folks should look into is Amazon Elastic Container Service, or ECS. ECS is a highly scalable container management service and you can use it to run, stop, and configure your containers on a cluster. With ECS, your containers are defined in a task definition that you use to run an individual task or task within a service. When I say service, I mean referring to, I'm referring to a configuration that you can use to run and maintain a specific number of tasks at the same time. ECS has a ton of great features available out of the box, but the most important one is the ability to auto-scale depending on your load. If you need the ability to scale as your app gets higher, gets higher load, you can use an Amazon ECS autoscaling group capacity provider with the manage and scaling option turned on. What technically happens with autoscaling turned on is that ECS creates two custom CloudWatch metrics and a target tracking scaling policy that attaches to your autoscaling group. Amazon ECS then manages the scale in and scale out actions of the autoscaling group based on the load your tasks put on your cluster. ECS is also quite cost-effective as containerizing applications require smaller compute sizes than hosting applications in virtual machines. As mentioned earlier, you can host all forms of applications on ECS, from ad hoc tasks to enterprise-scale solutions of any size. And how this is done is that ECS manages clusters of EC2 instances that have container orchestration tools running on them. ECS has access to these tools to enable, to enable patching of the instances as well as scale up and scale it down for you. So with that, how does ECS actually work? As mentioned before, Amazon ECS is a cluster of EC2 instances. When a task is instantiated, your task definition, which defines all the containers that form your application, is triggered. All required container images are pulled from a container registry, whether that be an ECR, Docker Hub, or somewhere else. Those images are used to build containers, and the requested task is run. This is all managed by the container agent on the instance, which is managed by ECS. 
And if you are already using or aware of building and deploying containers in a Kubernetes style, there is Elastic Kubernetes Service, or EKS. EKS is a managed version of Kubernetes that abstracts having to install, operate, and maintain your own Kubernetes control plane, or nodes. If you are not familiar with Kubernetes, it is an open source. What EKS does is it runs and scales the Kubernetes control plane across multiple AWS availability zones to ensure high availability. It automatically scales the control plane instances based on load, detects and replaces unhealthy control plane instances, and provides automated version updates and patching for them. Kubernetes has been labeled as the de facto standard when it comes to building microservice-based solutions because of the exceptional reliability and stability built into the framework due to high fault tolerance clustering. There are plenty of other reasons why Kubernetes is an excellent choice for container organization, but those are some of them. When choosing between EKS and ECS for container orchestration, the largest thing to consider is how you want your services such as networking or other components handled. ECS relies on AWS provided services like Application Load Balancer, Route 53, and others, while EKS handles all these mechanisms internally as these are core components of Kubernetes. EKS also runs up-to-date versions of the open source Kubernetes software, so you can use all the existing plugins and tooling from the Kubernetes community. Applications that are running on Amazon EKS are fully compatible with applications running on any standard Kubernetes environment, no matter whether they're running in an on-premise data center or public clouds. This means that you can easily migrate any standard Kubernetes cluster application to Amazon EKS without code modification. So with both ECS and EKS, there is still some management of the servers or instances of EC2. Not as much as owning the EC2 instances outright, but it isn't a completely turnkey approach. If you're looking for more set and forget and customize if you need it in the future, there's another offering for those services, and that is AWS Fargate. AWS Fargate is a technology that you can use with ECS and EKS to run your containers without having to manage them at all, so no provisioning, configuration, or scale required. When you run your Amazon ECS tasks and services with Fargate, launch type, or a Fargate capacity provider, you package your applications in containers, specify the operating system, CPU, and memory requirements, define networking and IAM policies, and then launch the application. Each Fargate task has its own isolation boundary and does not share the underlying kernel, CPU resources, memory resources, or elastic interface, uh, elastic network interface with another task. And since all the management is done for you, you have the ability to tap into great cost savings as you only pay for the resources you consume while they are running. So no overhead of an always-on EC2 instance. This also allows for more flexibility to scale up or scale down, again, bringing more cost optimization. So let's take a look at what actual difference is between EC2 managed ECS containers and ECS managed by Fargate. With both approaches, you still have to build the container image, but after that, it's, after that is where the real value of Fargate shows up. With Fargate, I don't have to define and deploy my EC2 instances, provision or manage compute or memory, isolate my applications or manage my running applications and their infrastructure. With Fargate, I just build the image, define how much compute my app needs and run it. The difference is not having to properly define, deploy, or manage my underlying infrastructure. Just define what my app needs and let Fargate do the rest. Now let's take a quick look at a demo of deploying a .NET app to ECS with Fargate using Visual Studio. All right, so here I am in Visual Studio 2022, and as you can see, I have um, just a very, very simple Razor page, .NET 6 Razor page application. So um, there's some CHTML files and um, I have program.cs and, and nothing really crazy. What I want to be able to do is I want to be able to deploy um, this .NET 6 application to ECS with Fargate. So I can go into Solution Explorer here and um, right click on the project file or the project and I can zoom in here. So I have this publish to AWS button, right? So this means I have the uh, AWS toolkit for Visual Studio installed. So I choose publish to AWS and it's gonna give me a handful of options. I can publish to an existing target or I can publish to a new target. And then it gives me a bunch of options as well. And the option that I, I care about in this particular case is this ASP.NET Core app to Amazon ECS using AWS Fargate. So I'm gonna click on this and I can choose the, the default settings here, but I wanna just go through so one of these settings are. So the first thing that you wanna do when you create an ECS instance is you wanna define the cluster. So let's give it a, a cluster name. So we can keep Fargate.net in this particular case just because it's straightforward. We can give it a service name. We can specify the desired compute. 
um, numbers as well as the particular CPU and resources that are left. So for in this case, it's a quarter of a C virtual CPU and half a gigabyte of memory because we have a pretty low um, footprint application. The next thing you can do is you can specify the load balancer. So in the situation where you want to direct traffic um, to your ECS instance, for certain use cases, you can do that here. And you can specify you know, a health check URL as well as different timeouts for that health check. And then the next step is auto scaling, which is setting um, basically if you want uh, Fargate to manage the scaling up and scaling down of your application. You can enable that there. I'm not going to do it in this particular sense. Um, in this, if you look at a previous video, we talked about IAM, um, AWS runs on a least privilege principle. So, um, specifying the particular role that you want this credentials to run under, um, we're just going to create a new role in this case. Uh, and then the next step is specifying a virtual private cloud, which is kind of like a virtual network. So let's just specify a new one in this particular case. I can add environmental variables if I want to, and then it specifies a Docker file path. So I didn't show you the Docker file, but let's take a look at it really quick. So in my solution, I have this Docker file. And inside of here, this is just a, a pretty simple one. Like I went through the um, Visual Studio wizard to create uh, a new ASP.NET Core application, and I checked the box that says enable Docker support, and it generates this lovely Docker file for us. Um, so if we go back here, um, we have everything that we need, and I can actually looks. I can specify the ECR repository where I want these images sent to. I provide that, and then I just click publish. And then the next thing that it's going to want to do is it goes through and actually builds out that Docker can, Docker image for us, and then it deploys that Docker image to ECR, and then at Fargate will take down that particular image from ECR and build an ECS instance. And this does take a little bit of time, so what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to fast forward. Um, to a particular point in time when this is all done. All right, so now that we're done, let's actually take a look at what actually happened as a part of that deployment process. So if we scroll all the way up here, um, we'll, we'll actually walk through what's actually going on. So it, what it does is it pushes our container image to Elastic Container Registry, like I mentioned earlier, and then it configures the uh, AWS Cloud Development Kit, or the CDK, to be able to do all the things that we talked about just now, the, the deploying of our container to the registry, publishing it, and then setting up all the uh, things that we specified. So the IAM roles, the ECS clusters, um, the VPCs, the load balancing route tables, all those sort of things. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, uh, we'll see that we have a, a total completion time and it's done, right? And then we have an endpoint here. So if I click on this endpoint, and let me just slide this over because it's on a different screen. As you can see here, there's that URL that we talked about. And then we have just the simple um, razor page for .NET 6, uh, ASP.NET Core. So that's pretty cool. And there you have it, folks, being able to deploy a .NET application as a container into AWS pretty seamlessly. I hope you liked it. I hope you want to play around with Elastic Container Service and let me know how it goes. Also, if you're liking the content here, be sure to like and subscribe, share along with your friends, and you know, let me know which else you want to see. This is Isaac Levin, another episode of AWS for the Non-Developer. Take care.